In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shusan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uloi. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high. But one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did it according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uloi, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep, with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the later time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram, which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the later time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which were told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. 
Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Amen. It is the second vision that within two years God shows to Daniel personally, because right until that point, God would show dreams to other people, and he would give the interpretation of the dreams of other people to Daniel. But now, during the reign of the last king of the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, of the Babylonians, of Belshazzar that is, who, as you recall, was the one who with his disrespect provoked God that last night of his life by reproaching the vessels of the temple of God, the holy vessels of the Old Testament. During the first year, God showed a vision to Daniel. It was in the seventh chapter where he revealed to him seven beasts. The first was the lion, and as we said, was the empire of Babylon and it lasted for 70 years from 606 to 536 BC. The second was the Medo-Persian Empire, it was like a bear, and it lasted for 200 years approximately, 530 until 330, and then was Alexander the Great with Greece, which lasted for about 200 years also, from 340 to 140 BC, and it looked like a leopard. The fourth beast, was exceedingly dreadful as a Roman Empire which also lasted for 200 years from 145-150 BC until 100 AD during the period of the First Apostolic Church. Especially though for the last beast Daniel sees also its evolution. It is one beast that evolves but before we see this evolution of the fourth beast let us see, I will read it, don't turn back to this. In chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, when God, Jesus Christ, reveals to John, the Antichrist, he reveals him with the same beasts. The leopard, the bear, the lion, and in the end there is a beast that is tremendous, which had great authority. Its wound, was more, he was mortally wounded and he had seven heads and ten horns. So we return now to the vision of Daniel. The Word of God is amazing, my brethren. It is uniformly bind together throughout all the books, even though the writers were different for most of the books, but we know that one is the writer, the author, and it is the Holy Spirit. He uses people, but the author is one, and the people are many. So in this first vision, in the first year of Belshazzar, God shows to Daniel the four beasts, I want to point out that Daniel has no vision about the age of grace of the Church of Jesus Christ and for that reason just as the first three empires as we said of the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the, of Greece and also Rome are one after the other. Especially for the last beast for the Roman Empire let us look at this it is in Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 let us see how nicely he describes these two periods of time. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. This is the Roman Empire with tremendous war power and ability, which destroys and tramples down all humanity back then. But the next beast, and the ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom. These ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom are the next step. This, con this continues after the Roman Empire if we take out of the way the Church of Christ, that period. So then the European Union begins, which has characteristics, first of all, that it doesn't have wars. Secondly, it doesn't prevail with wars and battles. And thirdly, it doesn't have a king, as all the other kingdoms had. They had Nebuchadnezzar, afterward the different kings that followed, then the Persians, Artaxerxes, Darius, Cyrus, and in the Roman Empire, again, there was one emperor. In the European Union, though, there are ten at the time being. There's not one, 
There are 10, but the one will be revealed. So now we are in this period, which has started from 1948, but in reality 1953. But it is in the last generation from 1948 after the creation of Israel again. And the second level, the second period of the fourth beast has begun. The first we said was the Roman Empire. The second is the European Union. And it is amazing that after 2,000 years now, at this moment, 15 European countries have a common currency. The common army is being prepared. The common borders are being prepared already with the agreement of Sagan. If I remember well, 10 countries have agreed for common borders. And many more nations are being prepared to enter. So it is expanding in an amazing way that it isn't with war, it isn't conquering this fourth beast in this period of time with the 10 kings. But this period also will end because in verse 24 I go on and I read again from the beginning that ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom where we are as we said today and another shall arise after them after this period another shall rise not others many but one and he is the Antichrist he shall rise after them and he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings and he shall speak pompous words and these are the characteristics of the Antichrist he shall speak pompous words against the Most High he will be disrespectful he will not only be disrespectful but he will also blaspheme God he will speak against the Most High he shall persecute the saints of the Most High and here let's pay great attention this isn't the Church of Christ the Church of Christ has left because if the Church of Christ hadn't left he wouldn't have the power to reveal himself this person the Antichrist he will persecute the saints of the Most High and we will analyze this and he shall intend to change times and law he will change everything then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time for three and a half years the last three and a half years after the first three and a half years of the last week of the people of Israel the things will be in greater prosperity and freedom the mark and the worshipping of the icon of the Antichrist will be optional he will suggest this the Antichrist but after the three and a half years he will become a dictator and then he will enforce with the consequence that you will not be able to buy or sell anything you will not be able to live in reality whoever doesn't worship the icon of the Antichrist and doesn't put on the mark on his right hand or forehead and in verse 26 we go on but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever this is the second coming when our Lord Jesus Christ comes down but first the sign of the Son of Man has appeared in heaven at the end of the seven year period he has sent his angels to gather and collect the saints with the gathering of the angels he has all these things have occurred on earth and heaven after that the marriage of the lamb is taking place and after the marriage of the lamb and the presence of the bride and the friends of the bridegroom the bride is the church of Christ which was raptured in the beginning of the seven year period and the friends of the bridegroom are the people of the Old Testament because the church was raptured by Christ himself and in the end of the seven year period the friends of the bridegroom those are of the Old Testament BC but also of the seven year period of the Antichrist who will be gathered by the angels so after the marriage of the Lamb is completed and everything comes into perfection up in heaven then according to the Word of God God will subdue everything under Christ Christ will come down with all his saints of the New Testament of the Old Testament but also all the angels his angels and the Antichrist will see the host coming down with Jesus Christ on his horse he will consider that they are aliens and he will create the conditions for the battle of Armageddon he will gather all its armies all the people so they can fight against those intruders those aliens who are none others than Jesus Christ and his saints of course a battle won't take place but the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast into hell and that will be the first time when the gates of hell will be opened and he will be cast in there the false prophet and the Antichrist but Satan and the devil will be tied up for a thousand years 
In that period of a thousand years, he will reign upon the earth, on the throne of David, in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ, with a rod of iron, upon all nations, and the holy people of God will be enjoying their wage upon the earth, having authority over cities, as it is written in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This is, in a general description, and very shortly, the vision, the first vision that God showed to Daniel. But now he is showing a second vision, a different genealogy, I would say. And this, is, this amazes me because Jesus Christ himself also has two genealogies. He has one in Matthew, one in Matthew which starts from Abraham, and another in Luke with different persons from different branches, which starts from Adam, and they both end up in the birth of Jesus Christ from Virgin Mary. In chapter 8, we see and God reveals to us the second, not genealogical tree I'd say, but the second the historical tree of the Antichrist. His descent, in other words, from a different period. The second vision, this second vision, is in the third year of the King Belshazzar, where Daniel is on the river Ulai in the province of Elam, and as he lifted up his eyes suddenly, he saw there standing beside the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Because we know that in the end, God sends Gabriel to reveal to him to Daniel and to explain to him and interpret this vision we will be looking at these things at the same time so we can have the vision and the interpretation that the Word of God gives at the same time so I read again verse 3 then I will read verse 20 then I lifted my eyes and saw and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high but one was higher than the other and the higher one came up last. And now the interpretation that the Lord gives, verse 20, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. They are again, but this is the beginning now from this historical course, it is from the Medes and Persians. We start from the empire of the Medes and Persians, and the ram is the empire of the Medes and Persians, which has two horns, the Medes and the Persians. The second came up last, but it was greater, exactly as it happened. The Medo-Persian Empire started with the Medes, but it ended, it evolved, and it finished with the Persians, who are the second horn, who came up later on, and it became more powerful and mighty than the first. So we continue to verse 4 now. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. I want us to pay attention here in this illustration that God shows us that the ram is pushing toward the west, toward the north, and toward the south, which means that he is on the east. So he is in the east and he is pushing toward the south, toward the west and toward the north. And no beast, no animal was able to withstand him. So thus we see that there was perfect prevalence of this empire of the Medes and Persians. Verse 5, And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west. Look at this. From the west the male goat came, which is Greece. So regarding the east, he has the Medes and Persians. And southeast, he has the glorious land, and toward the south, he has the whole territory of Egypt, and generally of Libya. And it is the truth that Alexander the Great even reached, he conquered all those lands. I'm reading that again. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I saw standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. 
And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great up to there. And so there was a male goat coming from the west. The interpretation that is seen now in verse 21. And the male goat is the king of Greece. And the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. He is the first king. It is very clear that the Greek empire is starting here whose main offense was against the Medes and Persians. I read it again. I saw him confronting the ram, which are the Medes and Persians, and he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast them down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great. Perfect prevalence of Alexander the Great over Persia and over all the East. But the vision continues, verse 8. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host, and some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Let us see also the interpretation immediately by the word of God. Verse 22, as for the broken horn, the great horn that was broken, and the four that stood up in its place, reveals that four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And it is the truth, and these are amazing things, of course, that these have been written many, many years before Alexander the Great, and obviously many, many years before us, but exactly as God showed these things to Daniel, that is how they happened. And for that reason, my dear brethren, let us point out something which is absolutely correct. That history is written by the hand of God. History of men from the beginning and until the end is ordained by God. It didn't happen because suddenly powerful men appeared uh, like Nebuchadnezzar, or like Cyrus, or Darius, or Alexander, or Caesars. I don't know who created the Roman Empire. But all these things, and behind all of history, is the Lord. But just as He is behind of all human history, and all the work of the Lord is done, so that God can bring salvation to all people, if it be possible, and anyway, all the ones who will call upon the name of Christ in the end. We must also know two things, though. That the devil, who knows the scripture, resists the fulfillment of the word of God. He is resisting it with all his power. But that is absolutely comforting, because just as he hasn't and he can't change the course of human history and finally that which God wants happens because he also raises up enemies. He also raises up situations and he also tries to change the plan of God. But just as he can't change to the least the plan of God in this world history of humanity, just in the same way, God is behind the history of every one of us. And when I say history, I mean our personal life. Since the time we are born, God is behind our life. And as he is striving for his plan to be fulfilled, and on one hand, his historical plan, he achieves it because the, the will and the seeking of man himself isn't necessary. 
In the same way, He is striving to fulfill His plan in our life for our salvation with all His power. But concerning this, He doesn't always succeed because the devil uses a factor of the human personality as God has created him, which is perfect freedom. And God cannot break his word. He is faithful to his word. He cannot deny himself. When he is striving to bring us to heaven, contrary to that, the devil is striving also, being a murderer from the beginning, to throw us into darkness. And many, many times God achieves his goal, but also many times the devil achieves his goal. And the crucial point for man is obedience to his word. The crucial point is for you to accept the will of God. Because what does the devil do? What is he trying to do? He's trying to take you away from the will of God. From the time you will accept his word, from the time you will call upon the name of Christ, from that point on, he loses his authority on you. So the man who calls upon the name of Christ and is saved has, he himself has also authority as if he is Christ himself. Because when we say in the name of Jesus Christ, it is we take the authority from God just as Christ did. By using not our sacrifice, by using not our holiness and our cleanness, but by using the name of Jesus Christ, in other words, the holiness of Jesus Christ, by using the cleanness of Jesus Christ, by using the victory of Jesus Christ against the devil. It is a grace that God gives to us, but it is also something else. As we said, Christ is striving and so the devil is striving. So, your life is the center of a war that is spiritual. There is a spiritual war going on, a big war, a vicious war. And the weapons that Christ uses are the weapons of righteousness. The weapons that the devil uses are the weapons of unrighteousness and cunningness. My, our salvation is not, if I, and may God forgive me for saying it in this way, neither our ability, neither our power, neither even our holiness. But our salvation, my dear brethren, is our faith. Jesus Christ says, Fear not. In this war that you are fighting, I overcame this war and you will overcome also. And this victory that overcame the world is your faith. So what is the devil trying to do? He wants to bring down your faith. He wants to make you say there is no God. He wants to make you say God doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't the truth. Then he has won. It doesn't matter if you have fallen once, twice, many times. The sure thing is that Jesus Christ, as many times as you will fall, he forgives you. What matters is if you doubt the love of Christ. Do not doubt the mercy of Christ. Do not doubt the power of Jesus Christ. And that is our faith. And that is where God tries and tests man. That is where man becomes approved. Where? In faith. In the trial of faith. And when he says, you enter many temptations, have great joy, because it is necessary for your faith to be tested. Because no one unapproved will enter the kingdom of heaven. So, it is a war that is harsh and vicious. But we thank God because we are not fighting it. Christ is fighting it for us from the time we believe. When you put Christ in front, Christ will fight your battles. When you get in front, Christ will be close to you to help you, but you will be overcome. Man cannot win. Man cannot face the devil, my brethren, except in the name of Jesus Christ and with the blood of Christ. The devil is a being that is a lot more powerful than man. Man was made inferior to angels, just as Christ, as a son of man, came to earth a bit inferior than angels. But he overcame. And his victory was what? His trust in his Father. He gave up himself to the one who judges righteously. That was his victory. He didn't fight for himself, but he let the Father 
fight for him. He did two or three things that were simple and he asked from us even. First of all, the will of Christ was exactly the will of his Father. The words of Christ were exactly the words of his Father. And the works, he said, I do not do these works. My Father does these works. These works are my Father's. My Father does these things. And in the end, before he left, he said something, my dear brethren, which let us never forget. Please, never forget this. The work that I did, you will also do. And greater than these things you will do. But now that I'm leaving, I'm not leaving you orphans. You won't see me, he said to his disciples, because I will be in heaven. But it is in your interest for me to go, because when I will go, then I will send a different comforter upon the earth, and he will remain with you forever. This comforter, the spirit of truth. And so, my dear brethren, man is in this blessed and safe position. He has an intercessor in heaven, and he prays for him, for his sins, so he can find grace by God. That is Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is our interceder up in heaven, who stands on the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. But we also have an intercessor on earth. Where? Within us. Hallelujah. Within us, because we are a temple of God, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Comforter is inside us, and He prays with groanings that cannot be uttered, and He prays for those things which we do not know, neither how to pray, neither what to pray. And He prays for our sicknesses, for all our weaknesses, for all our sicknesses. The Comforter prays. And I want to tell you something, my brethren, which amazed me at least. Saturday night when I was a bit sick, we took the car with my wife, we went down and I was feeling bad. And I prayed. And the Lord filled me in the Holy Spirit. Well, what can I say? Everything changed. This dew came upon me, this joy, this peace. He gave me a hymn of thanksgiving in the car. And I said, what would I do without the Comforter? What would we do without the Holy Spirit? How nicely he says it. He prays for our weaknesses. Hallelujah. We thank God for everything. We thank Him for everything. Because He is Almighty, our God, my brethren. But let us continue with the grace of Christ in our lesson. So from these four kingdoms, we continue in verse 22, the interpretation that God gives to our brother Daniel. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the later time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. So he is the Antichrist, the one he will be a descendant of the empire of Alexander the Great. He will come from one of the four descendants of Alexander the Great, he will come from one of those four kingdoms. And the four kingdoms that we have talked about are Syria, Egypt, Asia, and Greece. Macedonia, Greece. So, so this is a nice cross-section in the Word of God through these two historical genealogical trees of the Antichrist that he will come from one of the kings, or uh, from a nation, from the continuance of the Roman Empire, which is the, Ro the European Union, and also one of those four descendants of Alexander the Great. So he will be from the Roman Empire, the continuance of the Roman Empire, but also from the continuance of the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great. And indeed, one of the four descendants. The only nation which is, at the same time, a continuance of the Roman Empire and a continuance of the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, at least up to this point, is Greece. Of course, there is Turkey, Asia in other words, but it appears that it will not be able to enter the European Union. And even if it does enter, of course, the European Union, the plan of God doesn't change. But as long as it doesn't enter, we are sure and safe through the Word of God to declare that Greece will play a decisive part in these last years 
the Antichrist will be a Greek. We've said this many times. We do not boast in this, but we are sad for this fact. But the Church of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with him. Neither will she know him. Neither will she understand him. Neither will she see him. But when all these things will take place, we will be in the air along with our Lord Jesus Christ and we will be enjoying the blessings up there with our new bodies until we go up to heaven to the marriage of the Lamb at the end of the seven year period. But let us see now this person because we have a good description here. And the Word of God describes very nicely, not beautiful traits, but with perfect detail, the Word of God describes this man. And in the later time of their kingdom, of those four, in other words, again, he doesn't see the church, our brother Daniel, at all. He doesn't see the dispensation of grace at all, because Daniel is the man who represents the people of Israel. He spoke even for the coming of Christ in the 69 weeks, and he also spoke about the 70th week, the last week that was given to the people of Israel, so they may repent because they crucified Christ after they are first deceived for the first three and a half years and we will see this also so in the later time of their kingdom when the transgressors have reached their fullness and this is a very beautiful sign of the rest of the church the only time in human history when sin will reach its fullness is at the time that moment when there will be no one in holiness and sanctification it is the time immediately after the rapture of the church because all the saints will have been raptured into heaven it is the time when darkness will be perfect complete full and then the antichrist will find his chance the devil and he will raise up the antichrist and he will give him his authority for the next seven years a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes this king the antichrist has the characteristic of a hard man and a cunning man and these are also the characteristics of the devil as we said Christ is fighting his battles with the weapons of righteousness love and truth the weapons of Christ are mercy and truth mercy and truth the weapons of the Antichrist are hatred harshness and cunningness lying exactly the opposite Mercy and truth are by Christ, and lying and evil are by the Antichrist and the devil. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. You see, they will make him king. Alexander the Great was powerful by his own might. Nebuchadnezzar was powerful by his own might. Caesar and the Roman empires, they were powerful by their own might because they were Romans and they had a Roman Empire he was a Greek and he had a Greek army the Antichrist will have power and might that is great but not his own power they will give it to him they will hand it to him the time will come in other words when he will take leadership Greece maybe but anyway we do not know this the Antichrist who will be a Greek and he will destroy fearfully excellently it says in the Greek his first action is to destroy his enemies and he will destroy them in a way that they will not realize this is happening he will be throwing the weight on someone else and this is also characteristic of the Roman Empire it was a very characteristic thing back then when Nero set Rome on fire and he accused the Christians for doing that but also all dictators did that he will destroy excellently, he shall prosper and thrive. He will have authority by the devil and with his cunningness and with his evil, whatever he does will prosper. And whatever he sets forth to do, he will achieve. So he shall destroy the mighty. And this is a nice interpretation here that we can give to these two categories. I'm reading verse 10 so we can see the interpretation that the Word of God himself gives us. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down, first of all, some of the host and some of the stars to the ground. What is this host? It is explained to us the mighty of the earth. 
meaning politicians, military people, he will destroy even the powerful and mighty of the earth. And he will destroy some of the stars, those are the holy people. He will even destroy the ones who believe, this is an example, they will believe from the preaching of the two prophets, who for the first three and a half years will be prophesying, and they will be saying, do not believe this man, he is not Christ, because he will be revealing himself as Messiah to men. And as it says later on, one-third of the holy people, one-third of the Israelites will believe him. And let us see this one-third, as it is described in chapter 12 in the book of Revelation, because John has the same revelation by the same God. I will read from chapter 12 and verse 3. Chapter 12, verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having said seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And in Daniel, he explains that from the stars some will be trampled down, who are the holy people. So he will deceive and he will accidentally destroy the mighty ones that resist him and he will also deceive, deceive and destroy and trample down one third of the people of Israel in the first three and a half years. And from that point on, the salvation of the people of Israel begins. But let us continue from Daniel, verse 25. Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. From now on, he, righteousness won't be reigning. And you know, my dear brethren, now in humanity, at this time, generally, righteousness is reigning. Because all the rules and authorities, the Word of God says, are given by the Lord. And he doesn't wear in vain the sword. That man that the Lord has appointed and given authority to defend the people of God in righteousness. Everything will change completely in the seven-year period of the Antichrist. The authority will not be by the Lord then. The authority then, which will rule over all humanity, will be by the dragon, will be by the devil and Satan. And righteousness won't be reigning then, but as he says, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Cunningness and deceit will rule humanity then. It is a special, separate dispensation here. You know, the ages that God has permitted in humanity, in the beginning of consciousness with Adam until Noah, then after Noah, I forget these things. Anyway, afterward, after Noah, from Noah till Abraham, it is the age of justice. From Abraham until Moses is the age of faith. Okay, let's say these from the beginning. Up to Noah is innocence. From Adam to Noah is the age of innocence. From Noah to Abraham, to Noah from Abraham is of justice. From Abraham to Moses is the age of faith. Uh, from Moses to Jesus is the law. From Jesus to the rapture, from the Pentecost until the rapture is the age of grace. And now we enter an amazing age, the age of the seven-year reign of the Antichrist, which is the age of the indignation, the age of the Antichrist, where the devil has perfect authority on earth. But also, through, but also in this age, God will bring great salvation. A great multitude will be saved then. So let us continue now. He shall exalt himself in his heart, and he shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. So this next characteristic is his pride. By seeing that he is achieving everything with the help of the devil, he will exalt himself. And he will exalt himself so much that he will even go against God, so that he will sit in the temple of God as God. And he will reveal himself that I am God. Then the people of Israel will realize when they see him sitting in the temple of Solomon and declaring himself God, they will realize that he is the abomination of desolation. He is, as Daniel says, he is the Antichrist, and the people of Israel will repent in masses. 
he will pour out a spirit of grace and of supplications on the people of Israel and the people of Israel will be saved. Of course the persecution that they will suffer, the people of Israel and everyone who will be convinced by the preaching and the preaching my dear brethren will be done by angels from that point on. Angels will be appearing in heaven and crying out, this is an amazing age. Angel will be flying in heaven and saying, do not put on the mark. He is the Antichrist. Whoever puts on the mark goes to hell. And men will be divided perfectly then. The people on one side will make the decision to die so they can go to the kingdom of heaven. The rest will make the decision to worship demons. There will be, from that point on, there will be an official worship of demons which have already started. They told me that on the television, I didn't see that, of course, but I believe they told me the truth, that on the television, Satanists appeared who said, we do not kill, we sacrifice. This is a religion. We sacrifice and we pray. And the television anchor said, yes, truly, they are not killing. They are making sacrifices. We have religious freedom. They can worship anything they like. These things are amazing things which have already started. May God protect us, dear brethren. Lately, they came and held their world conference, the Satanists. In the end, this great division will take place. People who will be left behind will either make the decision to die so they can go to the kingdom of heaven, and many will make this decision, a great multitude from every tribe, nation, race, and all the rest will turn and they will worship the demons officially in the Antichrist. They will be worshipping his icon. They will be worshipping the devil. But the triumphing of the wicked is short, says the scripture, and he shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And let's also see this breaking without human means as God had revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and he explained it to Daniel. If you want us to see this, it is a very good description. Verse 44 from the second chapter from the book of Daniel. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven, those kings, the ten kings, that is, of the empire of the Antichrist, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Uh, a rock will be cut out of the mountain of the Lord and it will fall on the statue that God so showed to Nebuchadnezzar, whose feet were of iron and clay which is the European Union, the evolution of the European Union. It wasn't crushed, and it won't be crushed by human power. No man, let us pay attention to this, my brethren, no human is able to overcome the devil. No one. And even if all men unite together, no one can resist his cunningness. No one can resist his evil. Only Christ. And for that reason, it is sure that only Christ can save. But Christ, the Son of Man, and let us pay attention to this. When we say that Christ will crush and he destroyed the head of the devil and he will destroy the empire of the Antichrist and of the devil, we are speaking about the Son of Man now, not God. Christ, God. Because that wouldn't be righteous. Because it is sure that God is able to crush the devil. The righteous thing in the righteousness of God is for man to destroy the devil. And man was the incarnated Word of God, who is the only intercessor between God and men, man, Christ, Jesus. And we thank the Lord because to this man, Christ Jesus, was given the name that is above all, before which every knee will bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. But also, 
This man, Christ Jesus, owes his victory to his Father. What does he say? When the Father subjects everything under the authority of Christ, you see the work. He will subject everything under Christ. Then, Christ, when he says everything, he accepts, of course, the one who subjected everything. Father won't subject himself under Christ. But when he subjects everything under Christ, then Christ himself will go and he will place everything under the throne of God and he himself will also subject himself to God. Man, Christ, Jesus, and then all and all will be God. Today, all and all is Christ and his church. These are two comparisons which are amazing. In the epistle to the Corinthians, we won't talk about it now, maybe another time, but it says that when God subjects everything under the feet of Christ, Christ will subject everything under God and he will be all in all God. But concerning the church, let us read in the book of Ephesians, an epistle toward Ephesians. It is in the first chapter in verse 22. He who fills all things in the church of Christ is Christ. He is the one who rules over everything. He is the head over everything and is in everything. He is the head of the church. Why? Because we all are subjected to Christ. We are not subjected. We, we do not have someone in between. We do not obey any man or person. We are all subjected and obey Christ. And all in all is Christ in His church. But now, in the end of all centuries, when God subjects everything under Christ, then Christ will go and give up everything to Him, and there will be all in all God. Hallelujah. So no man can overcome the devil and the Antichrist except the one who has the authority to judge living and dead and he is only Jesus Christ. He crushed the head of the devil on the cross of the Calvary and now he will crush it again by sending in the lake of fire the Antichrist and the false prophet and by tying the devil into the abyss for a thousand years. For a short while he will be set loose, again he will rise against the king of kings, and then it will, his end will come because he and all his angels and all the ones who were deceived by him will be cast by Jesus Christ into eternal perdition, into the lake of fire, and then the church of Christ, all the believers of the Old and the New Testament will be kings and priests of the Most High forever and ever. My dear brethren, we are blessed because our eyes see things which are amazing. And we do not see things now prophetically, but we see things that have already occurred. We do not see things that will happen. We see things like that also. But we also see most of the things that the Word of God says have already happened. They have already occurred. It is amazing. And something else which is also amazing, the Temple of Solomon needed exactly 46 years to be built. The amazing thing is that the European Union, so it can gain its currency, and so it can become one, because at this moment the currency is one. We are a nation. From this point on, we have details to fix. We needed exactly 46 years to do this. And just as Christ walked back then, as a, not as a king, but as a lord in the Temple of Solomon, so the Antichrist will also walk in the European Union. The imitation of the devil is tremendous, so he can deceive men. But we thank God because Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. We thank the Lord. And that is very comforting for us, as we said, and we will continue to say, because just as Christ destroys the works of the devil and finally the plan of God is fulfilled in humanity, and so also Christ, with all certainty, destroys the works of the devil in our life, and the plan of God will be fulfilled, my brethren. We will go to heaven. We will go to heaven. We will take part in the rapture of the church. It is certain because Christ will take us. He will receive us. He will prepare His church. Do not look at our weaknesses. Do not look at our falls. Do not look at our mistakes. But let us see our repentance, my brethren. 
From the time we make the decision to repent, to humble ourselves, and to return to God, then victory belongs to Christ. We will take part in the rapture of the church with all certainty. With all certainty. You won't be absent. Just be careful to repent. I must be careful to repent. We must be careful to never let anything that defiles our heart to stay. That's what Christ cries out to us. Give me your heart, my child. Your heart, I want it to be clean. Be careful. Do you love all your brethren? It is a very crucial point. Do you have anything against anyone? That is what we must deal with. Is there iniquity and transgression in your life? If you cannot, if you haven't understood anything yet, do not fear. But when God reveals it to you because He will reveal your mistake, then run quickly and repent. If you can't, fear not. But when Christ will give you the power, run again to repent. Let us not fear weakness and ignorance. Our falls, let us not fear them. It's not for us to fall. Let's not go into the other end. It's not for us to fall intentionally. But we must be certain in our heart that from the moment we want to go to heaven, God will take us. And I believe that we want. Do we not want to go? Of course we want. I don't want anything else. I'll tell you the truth. And I know that all of us, this is an example I bring as myself. I want two things. I want God to be with me here on earth and that day to come and receive me. What else can I want? I ask you, what else can we want? And if we also add a third thing, which is basic also, is for God to use us in His work, to work for His glory, to work for in the service of the gospel, in the service of the church, in the service of our brethren, so that we may enter and enter richly the kingdom of heaven. Fear not, believe only, my brother. God is with us. Either this way or the other, Christ will overcome. And if Christ overcomes, we will overcome with Him. Amen, Lord.